And that's where I was when 9-11 uh, kicked off. I was sitting in a training, uh, chemical warfare training, if you remember the, the outfits we had to wear. And I'm sitting in that class and that's when 9-11 happened. I went back and called the ops desk and, you know, and said, hey, what's going on? And, you know, the, the boss answered the phone. He's like, go home. He's Can't like, good. <laughs> you know, we, we, may, we may be on the road in 24 hours. And knowing with in the F-117, your mission is going to be night one you know you're the first one in, so you always have to be ready to go. Hey everybody, this episode is brought to you by the Freeman team at Spire Financial. Spire Financial is a national leader specializing in VA loans serving our veteran community. Contact the Freeman team at Spire Financial today and learn how to get your VA loan offer accepted through our Spire key approval. Our guest today, 20 year Air Force pilot who dropped the first bomb in Baghdad in the 2003 shock and awe campaign. And this is his story and his transition out of the Air Force into entrepreneurship and becoming one of the country's top financial advisors. Stand by, coming to David in five, four, three, two, one, and cue David. Steve, in from Texas, you ready to do this? I am, David, thank you so much for having me on your show. Oh, this is gonna be great. You know, very, very silly question I've always wanted to know, does the Air Force and Navy pilots, is there like inter-service rivalry at all? Well, I think there's inter-service rivalry uh, across the board in lots of things. And of course, uh, with Navy pilots, you know, it kind of goes back to Top Gun, which, you know, is all, of course, the Navy, Navy movie, but the Air Force really benefited from that, right? Because people are thinking pilots, you know, fighters, go off, let's fly uh, for the Air Force. But, uh, you know, they kind of had the cool movie with the cool uniforms and stuff. But then I would say, and I'm biased, that we have the, the cooler airplanes and things. Well, it's like the uh, Navy SEALs get Charlie Sheen, Green Berets get Rambo, yeah, and, you know. It, exactly. Yeah. Uh, but I have a lot of good friends in the Navy. And uh, like I said, when we go off to, you know, the war story we're going to be talking about today, uh, we go off and fly and things like that. We're brothers in arms and sisters in arms out there as it, you know, doesn't matter what branch you're in. Uh, so speaking of that, Walk me through, and I know this is not a quick story, but start us out like Air Force pilot, what do you gotta do to get there? And then maybe just sure. a few stages of your career, because you couldn't have gone from graduating flight school to flying the stealth right. plane. I, mean, that... uh, I will say I'll start it all the way back with, I was a junior in high school and Top Gun came out. So being an impressionable young person uh, like everybody else, I walked out of Top Gun and I said, I want to do that for the rest of my life. Mm. Uh, the friend I was with kind of laughed. I was like, sure, buddy. You know, went home, told my parents. And even though my parents were, my dad was uh, Air Force, retired Air Force. Oh, he yeah, wasn't okay. a pilot, but uh, he was like, uh, let's just have a plan B. You so know? did you grow up then in the Air Force community as a military brat, per se, as they call it? I did, but uh, my dad retired when I was in fourth grade. So I okay. kind of don't really recall the bouncing around. Got it. Um, but yeah, I saw it and I was just like, I want to fly fighters for the rest of my life. Hmm. And went off to college, didn't get into the Air Force Academy, so I was kind of heartbroken over that because that was kind of the easier path. Um, went off to college, graduated from college with an engineering degree, applied for flight school, finally got in, took a little while. Civilian flight school at that time? Nope, uh, military, okay. Air Force flight school uh, to become an Air Force pilot because otherwise I was just going to be an Air Force officer. So I joined oh. the Air Force um, through, a schol through scholarship and, but I was going to be a maintenance officer. So I started my first four years, like I said, like I worked for a living, <laughs> actually was in maintenance. Um, and then I kept applying for pilot training. And then once I got in, um, what airplane you get out of pilot training is completely based on your performance. Interesting. So w did well enough to get into a fighter. I flew the F-15 first, which is the little tiny one on the name tag. And uh, as opposed here. to fighters, for people listening, the other path might be what transport, like a C-17 type aircraft. Sure, there's kind of fighters and then there's bombers. Those are the folks that are kind of go out and execute warfare from a kinetic perspective, you know, missiles, bombs, that Got sort it. of stuff. Then you have refuelers and transport, which are now primarily logistics, either moving people, things, bombs. As we recently the saw the so. events in Afghanistan, and we, we won't get into that, but yes, okay, I'm with you. But yeah, so <laughs> anybody that wants to fly, you're happy to fly anything. Interesting. Right, so you don't, you don't really go into pilot training thinking I have to have a fighter. Uh, you want, a lot of folks want fighters, and I, I did but it was, I'd be happy to fly anything for a job. And then I flew the F-15 for three years. Uh, to be able to fly the F-117, the, the, the jet in front of us here, 
uh, you had to have 500 hours in a primary fighter. So you had to be an experienced fighter. How many hours, hours. I'm sorry? 500. 500 which, hours. That's hard to imagine. So what that means is about three years of experience. Got it. Of flying one of the frontline fighters like an F-15, F-16. And is it a application mm -hmm. process to move to that, a selection process? How does that work? So it, it's kind of behind the scenes. Um, so they look at your career development and whether you want to go fly it. It's in the middle of New Mexico. Hmm. which a lot of folks are like, I don't want to go live. You know, I like New Mexico. I met my wife in New Mexico, got married in New Mexico. Uh, I think New Mexico is beautiful, but a lot of people don't want to. Uh, I was living on the beach in Fort Walton Beach flying fighters. There you go. Yeah, you know, initially. But they're like, do you want to go do this? And I was like, I would love to go do it wow. um, to be part of the program. Because with the airplane, there's the flying piece, which is really neat. But there's also the technology piece. And, you know, I'm a nerd, self-professed. Uh, I wanted to know, you know, How's it stealthy? How's it fly? You know, all the behind the the super secret stuff. I wanted to be read in on all that, and uh, that was one of the benefits of the program. And what year was that? So, that Ish. was '99 when I got picked up for the program, and then oh, I wow. actually went out and started flying it in early 2000. So, caging ourselves to 9/11, I had been flying for a little over a year and a half. You know, when 9/11 happened. So what? I mean. Beyond the shape, from a, from a layman's term, I see the shape, I'm like, oh, that's cool. Uh, you know, I, I see it on TV years ago, here and there, I'm like, oh, that looks cool. But what makes it so different from an aircraft's perspective? Well, it was born out of the, the late 70s. So we came out of Vietnam as a military saying we needed more tactical aircraft. We need more fighters. And we came out with the series of the F-14, which was featured in Top Gun, F-15, F-16, F-18. All those came out, but they wanted something that was different that was gonna be a true stealth aircraft, the invisible man, if you will. Um, and we'll get to that later. Not quite invisible, but <laughs> in, in, invisible enough. And so to design it, instead of going to the aeronautical engineers and saying, design an airplane, and then going to the stealth engineers and saying, make it stealthy, they did it backwards. They said, okay, that's not working, right? Because that keeps we keep getting the same type of airplane when we do that. So we're going to go to the stealth engineers first. Interesting. You guys figure out how to make it stealthy. And then once they came up with this crazy shape, and it's the stealthiness is largely 90% um, of it is the shape. And when you look at if you were to sign a, shine a flashlight at this, the, the surfaces are all, you know, they're multifaceted, if you will. It really wouldn't, very little would reflect back at you. So when you think of it from a radar beam perspective, you know, radar beam hits it and then it scatters versus being reflected right back at it, which is what you know, gives it the stealthiness. And the other 10% of stealthiness is this uh, black surface card called radar absorbent material or RAM. And it's basically uh, a honeycomb structure that kind of captures the rays, if you will, and kind of holds on to them. So they designed huh. it that way and said, hey, this will be stealthy. And then they gave it over to the aeronautical engineers and say, hey, you guys need to make this Fly. So radar waves are hit it, and instead of the waves bouncing back and collecting a signal or whatever have you, they're being dispersed. Right, they'll deflect, and then some are being straight absorbed. Interesting. So, but yeah, then they handed it to the guys to make it fly, and they're like, well, that won't fly. I mean, look at it, it doesn't even look like a normal airplane. And they're like, well, you need to make it fly. <laughs> and if you put enough motor on anything, you can, you know, anything will fly. But, you know, it won't fly, you know, necessarily. The aerodynamics of the F-117 are different, really, than any other airplane out there. And it's run by computers, uh, very complex. You as the pilot still sit there and do the, you know, you have a stick and throttle, just like any other airplane. But really the computers are doing all of the movement of the, the control surfaces that are at different angles and things from a normal airplane. So was that difficult or weird for you to fly then? It was different. To learn? It was different. Did you feel like you had less control? Well, it, uh, it was just, it, it didn't respond like an F-15 in uh, being fortunate to fly a frontline fighter like an F-15 or F-16 or any of those F-series that I just talked about. I mean, when you move the stick to the left and pull back, you get a 9G turn. I mean, you are moving right now. Wow. Um, in this thing, it was a little, it wasn't quite instant. And it wobbles a little bit, which is weird. Uh, one of the nicknames is Wobbly Goblin. Um, from when you go to make moves, it kind of overshoots. There's because some, of such a weird shape, the computer has to control all aspects of it to keep it in flight? Is that what you're saying? You're, you're telling the airplane, here's what I want to do. And instead of a normal aircraft where you would have pulleys and things and you're getting exactly what you asked for, you're actually saying, I want to go left. And the airplane's going, okay, he wants to go left. Let's do this. And then it's like, he doesn't want to do that anymore. And so it ends up overshooting and there's some coupling there that makes it a little bit goofy. Uh, when you first fly, you think something's wrong with the airplane. Because you know whether, you know, it's not, it's not acting right. 
But then folks are like, no, that's, <coughs> that's just the way this thing is. It just wobbles a little bit. You'll, you'll forget about it, and you honestly do. After about three flights, you're like, no. That's just the way it is. So what were your first couple missions then, or first, once you graduate the training for that program, where, where, where did you go and what did you do? Well, you practice training since the primary mission of the F-117 is that night precision attack. Um, if you think of it, so that's a lot of words, but the, uh, you're the kicker on the football team. So when you mm. think of how is the F-117 used in Desert Storm, you know, it's night one. You're going to go in, you're going to poke out the eyes and ears. So eyes being radar sites, ears being the communication centers. You're going to go out and you're going to destroy these things. And you're going to make it so the enemy can't, can't see and can't talk to each other. So the, to practice those missions, you're primarily, unlike other airplanes that are out there, you're primarily bombing downtown in cities. So you can't practice that. Right? <laughs> um, so you practice with what's called a camera attack, where you fly over like El Paso or Albuquerque or different uh, you know, city dimming cities in New Mexico, and you practice on their bigger structures by you fly over it at 20,000 feet, so the, you know, people don't even know you're there. But you're actually pretending that you have a bomb, and you're using the camera and then the little crosshairs, if you've ever seen the, the footage from the cockpit, and you're putting the crosshairs on the vent on top of the building, and you're practicing your attack, obviously with nothing leaving the airplane. Damn. And of course, the population don't, doesn't need to be concerned uh, <laughs> that we're doing that, but that's how you practice. Um, hitting targets in a big city, knowing that you're going to either do it in Baghdad, uh, Pyongyang in Korea, China, you know, wherever you're going to be needed for your mission is going to be largely big city targets. So you were just getting out of there right around then 9-11. I was. So I get there. Uh, it takes about a year to become fully trained uh, in the, your mission capable, but then you're, it means you can go off to war after a few months. But then mm. to get all of your other qualifications where you can lead others and become a mission commander mm. and lead the strike, all that takes a little over a year wow. uh, to become an instructor in the airplane. And that's where I was when 9-11 uh, kicked off. I was sitting in a training, uh, a chemical warfare training, if you remember the, the outfits we had to wear. And I'm sitting in that class, and that's when 9-11 happened. I went back and called the ops desk and, you know, and said, hey, what's going on? And, you know, the, the boss answered the phone. He's like, go home. He's Can't like, good. <laughs> yeah, we, we, may, we may be on the road in 24 hours. And knowing with in the F-117, your mission is going to be night one. You know you're the first one in, so you always have to be ready to go. So 9-11 happened. And if, you know, for, for your listeners and viewers, you know, thinking about where you were and how much of a surprise that was, is we were so angry as a country, right, that this happened. Once we figured out it wasn't an accident, it was actually a terrorist attack. And then it was who's, you know, we need to go kick somebody's ass for this because we're American, that's what we're gonna do. Well, we didn't know who. Um, so literally the boss is like, go home. Uh, so you go home, get your fares in order like every other, you know, war fighter out there. Um, make sure everything's in place because you're gonna go and you don't know when you're coming, coming home. And, but we didn't know who the enemy was gonna be, which was just kind of weird as, as a country. And was there any talks in the coming days after we kind of had more intel and whatnot of going to Afghanistan or anything like that? There was, and then the particular challenges of Afghanistan was once we kind of figured, okay, terrorist attack, who was it? And, you know, standard terrorist groups, every, every amateur terrorist group out there, you know, took credit for 9-11, right? Like, yeah, that was us, you know, dun, 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 uh, when it wasn't, obviously. Right, right. Um, but so they're just trying for, screaming for attention. Well, we, you know, once we figured, okay, there's these terrorist training camps in, um, in Afghanistan, bin Laden's behind this, um, to go take out these terrorist camps, really the F-117, for us to do it, we were going to have to deploy forward somewhere in the Middle East and then launch missions to go Stay into out. Afghanistan and drop bombs and then come back out. Well, we just had this beautiful airplane called the, 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 the Mama Stealth, we call it, the B-2 bomber that can do that for us, and it can fly a 40-hour mission. So the, the government decided, well, let's just have the B-2 bombers do this. Mm. So the B-2s were literally taken off from the States. I remember those Dropping days. bombs in Afghanistan and then either coming back to the States or going to a, another place and then coming back from there. Yeah. Uh, so we didn't get the call, but our particular mission set is more of the go into a downtown type area and do a very surgical strike, you know, take out the Air Force headquarters but not affect the the hospital or the Wait. school or anything else that's around it. Yeah. Uh, the B-2s just went and you know kind of laid waste to some stuff in Afghanistan. Well, you had a <laughs> chance to do that because life progressed. And mm -hmm. then it's funny how when we were talking about this, uh, the few conversations we've had the past month, I mean, you know, 9-11, 
here we are, Afghanistan, two years later, it's like, oh, maybe we should go to Iraq now. It was an interesting time, and I'm 30 or so, so really fairly young and, and not 30 years that, old. Not out of experience. Yeah, 32, 33, that, somewhere yeah, in there. And it, wow. Um, but it's the, but watching our country go from, we obviously, we got punched in the face at 9-11, right? We didn't see it coming, so this, this embarrassing terrorist event happens. Um, and then, of course, we're war fighters, so you have to go kick somebody's butt. Uh, and then we start dealing with you know, terrorist groups in Afghanistan, and then it became this, the, the conversation changed. And again, George, George Bush uh, Jr. was the president. We started talking about axis of evil. It's like, okay. And then we started talking about Iraq. It was like, okay. And from a, you know, we're expecting to take this airplane and then do something to avenge 9-11. Well, then all of a sudden it was Saddam, if you remember uh, Colin Powell, who was one of the most trusted names in the military and outside of the military, when he stood up in front of the United Nations mm -hmm. and said, we have a slam dunk case. If he says it, you can take that to the bank because there's really nobody else you could trust more than Colin Powell. And sure enough, uh, you know, that was the WMD in Iraq. And then it was the we're going to Iraq and we're going to take out Saddam Hussein. And we are going to, you know, stop him from using WMD on his own people, which were some sketchy, uh, not, not, didn't necessarily know he was actually doing that. But we were going to stop it from happening. Mm -hmm. so, so that's what kind of led the narrative to Iraq. So then the jump right into the nuts and bolts and, and what we're going to get into. I want to read something because uh, I think this is a pretty unique intro. Obviously, I didn't write it, but <laughs> General Tommy R. Franks, commander of U.S. Central Command, said at a press briefing in Qatar, March 22nd, you might have even been there, I don't know, mm -hmm. this will be a campaign Unlike any other in history, a campaign characterized by shock, by surprise, by flexibility, by the employment of precise munitions on a scale never before seen, and by the application of overwhelming force. What he's referring to is this shock and awe campaign. Reverse engineer this for me from a high level of what was the shock and awe campaign? It's intended, you know, commander's intent, if you will, sure. mm -hmm. all the way down to what did you actually do in this campaign? Sure. Well, the, uh, the, the shock and awe campaign obviously changed my life because being that, you know, dropping the first bomb of that shock and awe campaign is what I've been talking about now for going on 19 years uh, of being the opportunity to be able to do something like this. And when we first started <coughs> talking about Iraq, we, Rumsfeld, Secretary Rumsfeld, uh, was talking about, hey, let's build an air power plan to where we want to go ahead, or we want to, for the first three nights of the war, uh, we want to bomb them around the clock with different target sets. It didn't matter what it was, but basically 72 hours of continuous air power, mostly bombing. There's some jamming. There's some uh, other political things, dropping leaflets. I mean, there's a big plan there. But, you know, largely the bombing, and we wanted to keep basically the Iraqi military forces awake for 72 hours to where not only are they worried about their lives, they're, they're not able to sleep, think, communicate, any of that stuff. So that was kind of the plan. And this uh, is one of the largest in. campaigns in, I mean, the U.S. modern day air camp bombing history, huh? It is. And when you look at total tonnage of the bombage that was dropped, it was bigger than Hiroshima or Nagasaki. I mean, it really is the biggest ever um, if you count it as, a, as one big package. Um, and then the way we were going to do it is it started at 9 o'clock p.m. Baghdad. We didn't know when it was going to start, but whenever it kicked off, it was going to be early in the evening uh, Baghdad time. Uh, we we're going to put some cruise missiles in first, uh, which is going to basically knock out the last little threats that were going to be there for me, which is some surface air missiles, some radar sites, some communications nodes. Wow. All of that was going to get hit, and then we were going to start flying manned airplanes with the F-117s going first. Um, and my particular mission going absolutely first through to take out one remaining command center uh, that was a five-story building, so you couldn't take it out with cruise missiles. Mm. So I had to go take that out, and then from there, uh, B-2s, F-15Es, F-18s, basically continuous air power was going to happen for 72 hours. And while that was going on, at some point the Army, I should say ground forces, not Army, but the ground forces were going to get the thumbs up, and then in they, in they come, right? And it was all this, you know, coordinated 
uh, you know, we're going to basically turn the place upside down for 72 hours, and then when the ground forces come in, they'll have an easier go of it as far as executing their mission. So before you go any further, to mm -hmm. summarize this, this is Iraq 2003, the first ever, the, the, this, this air mission was to go in, completely just bomb the shit out of everything for 72 hours straight to give everybody there a sense of just paralyze them almost so they just have lost the will to fight, com ensue complete chaos, everything goes nuts, and then the ground forces come in after that. Correct, with a slight caveat of it was a very strategic type bombing. In other words, we weren't going to level the city. Correct, um, correct. Unlike we've done good in point, the past, good point. Right? Um, but it was very targeted uh, mass application of air power of only military structures. And the goal, if you heard Rumsfeld talk, Secretary Rumsfeld talk about this, he goes, if we do this correctly, you know, and here I am, you know, young warfighter, brand new major, <laughs> uh, you know, he's like, you know, ladies and gentlemen, if we do this correctly, we will be able to walk into Baghdad and we will be met with open arms by the, the Iraqi people and they will give us flowers and chocolates. Because we're, we're done bombing them. Because we are now there to save them from their evil dictator. Interesting. And, and it's, you, know, you hear that and you're like, so I'm going to drop bombs on Baghdad and then the ground folks are going to go in some point after that and they're going to be welcomed. Like, thank you so much. It's like, I don't know if that's, uh, you know, I don't think history uh, played out that way. <laughs> so we'll talk about that. So take me back then. You're about to go do this. How many planes? How long did you train for this? Were there, I mean, the routes, I know you went from, was it north to south? I did. And then was mm -hmm. there also east to west? I mean, what was the, what, was, what did that all look like? Sure. So when you build an air power campaign, it ultimately and doctrinally, you start kind of with the target set and the end objective. So. You say, okay, in Baghdad, we want to destabilize their military. We want to knock out their eyes and ears, but we want to leave things like, you know, power plants. We don't want to take power from the people. You know, we don't want to blow up the wa water and bridges and things that we're going to have to turn around and rebuild. Sure. You know, that, that was Vietnam style, right? It was mm. like, just go blow it all up. And then we figured, well, we're going to have to go back and rebuild all that. So hmm. let's just not blow that up in the first place, right? Let's be a little more uh, strategic about what we're doing. So you build out the target set. And then we have the fortunate ability up in uh, Nevada to be able to have a large chunk of airspace to where we can really practice, if you will. So think hundreds of miles of open land, you know, Area 51, all the, you know, the, the stuff that's rumored is kind of hidden on this range. And you fly over this range and that's where you really practice as if you're going over Baghdad. Interesting. And we practice in such a, a challenging environment that when you go to execute the mission, it's a lot easier than it was when you practiced it. So when you say how long, I'd say we practiced this for about six months. Oh, wow. Um, on occasion, not every day, but you would get the forces together and you'd practice this to make sure we kind of knew what we were doing. And then when we deployed over there uh, to the Middle East, we were out of Qatar and every day, we didn't know when go day was. We didn't know it'd be it, towards the end of March, but we got over there February, early February, and we would practice basically taken off out of Qatar, go up the Persian Gulf, where we had a couple carriers, you know, we had all these forces there. We'd go in through Kuwait, um, and then we'd turn around and come back home. Hmm. Knowing that one night we would end up going through Kuwait and up over into Baghdad. But you knew so it was a training, obviously, mission. It we wasn't did. Like you were, okay, yeah. We were trying to desensitize the Iraqi forces of that, oh, well, okay, it's going to be tonight. And then we turn around. And they're like, mm. oh, it's not tonight. And then after you do that over a month, then, you know, like everybody else, they're like, well, I'll just... One of, these days, the one of these days, but it was probably not tonight, and then sure enough, then, you know, the, the big day it was. Wow. So, so the night it happened, mm -hmm. the day, I mean, the day of go time, what, so, what were you feeling initially? So the strategy, to, to kind of answer your earlier question, then I will get to that. So the, the strategy was there was nine F-117s, so if you picture the helmet is, is Baghdad, um, and, and this is north, and we're looking, the, the camera angle is looking at, at the map of Baghdad. There were nine of us. Four were coming in uh, west to east, the other were coming in east to west, and then there was one lone ranger that had to go up north of town and go north to south through Baghdad to take out a command center that was up here north of town. Hmm. And that was one we had not been able to reach, and the cruise missiles weren't going to be able to take it down. It's a five-story building. So... Um, and even one F-117 couldn't take it down. So I had to come up here. I hit this target, um, put two 2,000-pound bombs in it, cratered about 60, you know, about 60% to 70% of it. 
went downtown. My second target was downtown. And then the other airplanes were all meeting to the exact second, 920 local Baghdad time, uh, all over ba downtown. And then there was wow. another airplane that was going to come up and hit the, the remaining part of the command center. Wow. So kind of finish the building off. So that was the overall plan. Um, and, you know, when you think huh. of, you asked about the, and then that, so that kicks it off and then B2s come in and, you know, then everybody else comes in after us. You talk about how you feel. Well, you're excited uh, that it's finally happening. Uh, Bush, I understand that. President Bush kind of gave the uh, 48 hours to get out of uh, Iraq, otherwise we're coming in. Uh, so he did that Monday night and then, you know, this was Friday is when we finally kicked off the uh, shock and awe campaign. And you're excited to go do the mission, to mm -hmm. do what you've always, what you've been training for. You're excited that, and that you're lucky enough to literally be the one getting called for this. And then I, through um, a, cer a different circumstance, ended up with this, high va this mission where I was going in first. I was originally the, going to be downtown and then be the guy that goes up and hits the target second, second on the and then ended building. up switching with my boss. So I was in there first and then he went up second to, to finish things off. Um, but going out the door, you're, I would say it's exactly like many books have been written about, you know, movies made about, you know, you're, you're making a historical maneuver and, you know, there's books that have been, the story has been carried in books and things and be talked about for a long time. But your personal feeling is, I don't want to screw up. Yeah. I don't want to let my buddies down. Sure. Because that's who I really care about. Mm -hmm. The strategy, sure. You know, I'm young. I, you know, I don't know if the strategy is going to work. I believe what we're doing as a country, but, you know, that's way above my pay grade, right? That mm -hmm. kind of mentality. But I want to make sure I go in and I hit my targets as I should. And then, you know, and then I'm ready to go the next night to go do it again. Is it all everything pre-programmed in the computer, the targets, lat long, everything like that? Everything is pre-programmed down to the exact second. Wow. So my uh, first time on target was 9-16-38. Uh, that was my command center time on target, that was exactly when it was gonna happen. Um, I was flying along the Iranian border. Since I had to go north of Baghdad, I had to fly along the Iranian border uh, to go get north of Baghdad to then turn around and come north to south through Baghdad. Right, so bow up and come back so, down. Yeah, so I had a super long route where I was literally the only one there. Huh. And I was a beam Baghdad when the Tomahawk missiles hit right at 9, 9 uh, p.m. smooth. So you see all these little pockets of, of you know, explosions, which is us, and what altitude are you at at that uh, point? We generally stay between 20 and 25,000 feet. So when you think of an airliner, you know, that doesn't mean a lot to a lot of people, right? So when you think of an airliner, generally an airliner is at that 35 to 40,000 feet. So, you know, a little over less than half of that, I guess I should say. Um, but it's just like flying over a city at night. Yeah. I mean, it's, wow. it's pretty, it wasn't blacked out. You would think maybe that it should have been blacked out a little more, but you know, that's up to the, up to Iraq. Um, but, uh, you know, there, it, it wasn't blacked out like you would think it would have been. Um, and all these explosions start going off, and then I see, you know, stuff starting to fill the air as far as muzzle flashes from the ground and anti-aircraft fire going up and surface-to-air missiles being launched. And, and they you're don't, in, you're they don't like, know. But you're in your own little zone, right? You're in your own little world, and are you just so focused on the instruments, and what's the... Actual glee, actually going through your head. Well, it, it's weird because in this airplane, uh, the computers are flying it. And like you said earlier, everything's pre-programmed. So, and we talked, to, we talked beforehand about the, a funny nickname for this is the cockroach because it's, it only flies at night. And then when you fly, instead of straight lines, every little bit, in case you're not quite invisible, uh, you, change degree, you change headings by at least 30 degrees and you change altitude. So the airplane's doing this, but it's all pre-programmed. My hands are not on the stick and throttle while I'm going into my target, which is crazy, right? You would think everything is about flying the airplane there. It's not, the airplane's basically flying itself. And I come in to when it's time to actually employ the ordinance to make sure that I can identify that I have the 100% for sure the correct target. How do you identify what um, are you looking through? You, you're looking through the bottom of the airplane has an infrared camera, if you will. And well, it starts out the front of the airplane. You, you're looking long term, you're looking for a building and you have a series of satellite photos on your leg that you've memorized, but you also back up. 
and you're looking at making sure, okay, there's uh, nine, nine city blocks. I'm looking for this one. There's a bridge here. It's the second one over from that. Yep, yep, yep. Confirm I have the building. And then you move into closer pictures as you zoom in to make sure not only do you have the right building, but the right vent on the right building. Wow. You know, wow. So you're doing, that's your job is weapons employment. The airplane's actually kind of flying itself. So to take us back to when I was next to Baghdad and it's nine o'clock, the airplane's doing its thing. I'm literally a little kid like looking out the window <laughs> at Baghdad and you know, it's, I'm watching the, the clock in the airplane because you're blacked out so you, don't, you can't see your watch. So you have in the airplanes, you kind of glance at the clock and it's like five seconds, four seconds, nothing's happening, three seconds, two seconds, one second, then you look out and it's like, I mean, wow. it's just like crazy how precise everything was. Wow. Uh, and from there, because I'm going northbound around four, 450 miles an hour or so. Um, so I'm not there a long time to be able to watch this. Uh, but as I'm kind of watching Baghdad pass behind me, I'm seeing, you know, that's when I first started thinking all this stuff that is now filling the air. It's like, yeah, I get to turn around and fly through that in 20 minutes. Because <laughs> wow. because that's exactly because I can see where I'm going to be. Now, um, isn't there was, so. an aspect of this as well? You are saying that when you get close enough to your target, communication drops off and you have no comms with the outside world? It, it's even before that. So different from any other war fighting that I, that I can think of, even a special ops team that's going in a super secret mission, they're at least going to be on a, a closed circuit network or something to communicate with each other, even if it's only a few of you. Uh, when in the F-117, as you do what's called stealthing up, you bring all the antennas inside the airplane. And you know, the, the tolerance is on this thing to where oh. it goes in and then the tolerance is, you know, the, 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 the structure closes to where there's no, no seams or anything for a radar beam to, to pick up. You can't hear anything. So, and I would stealth up before, uh, south of Baghdad. So even before that nine o'clock, probably so 10 minutes to fly all the way back up. That. Yeah, yeah, so I Make a U-turn and then fly back down. Fly back down, Jeez. flying through all this and hitting my first target, hitting my second target, and then flying outside of the, I called it the ring of death, well, everybody called it the ring of death. Um, kind of the ring around Baghdad where he had burned some tires and there was some smoke. So you kind of get south of that, and then that's when you throw the antennas out and you check in. And that's the first time you've, you, you're hearing anybody. Other than that, it's just you all alone by yourself, and you don't know if other airplanes have been shot down. Uh, if there's an abort order, you would never get it. And that's what they always told you in the F-117 is, is they said, well, kind of the bad part of this is if we abort, if Rumsfeld called this thing off at 9.05, I don't know about it. I, there's no way to get to me. Is there any so. sense of peace or tranquility? You're there by yourself. You don't hear anything. There's not a lot of chatter. Is there any sense of calm? Uh, it's weird for sure. <laughs> um, I had the you just not knowing of what's going on out there, it, but it's okay. It's, it, it almost helps you focus on your mission. Right. Um, yeah. And then I was a Pulp Fiction fan, uh, still am. Uh, so I had memorized the Ezekiel 25, 17, the path of the righteous man. So I had kind of, you know, you entertain yourself, right? So I, I knew that this was going to be this way. Um, so when I went to drop on the first target, knowing that was going to be the, the first bomb from a manned aircraft that night, I'd, I'd memorized that, you know, it took me 43 seconds to say the full, full spiel. So. Um, so I was, you know, you would do things to, do, to make sure you hit the target, um, you know, came off the first target, look up, acquire the second target, you know, a couple minutes later, hit that, and then, uh, and then off target is when you kind of look around and realize, you know, I've, it's done. I, I'm <laughs> done. It's done. Yeah, you're right. It's, uh, I've, I hit my target. Mission accomplished. Um, and then right out the other side, and what I didn't know, um, which we didn't talk about earlier, you may have caught it in some books, but so there's nine of us on this attack. Right. I did not know until I'm off target, southbound, going back to the refueling track, only three of us made it across the target that night. Me meaning Three what? of the nine. The other six airplanes did not meet some timing sorts of things and they had to abort, so they didn't even go. So, so if they can't meet that time, they have to drop their bomb, they can't, it's over, they can't They can't late? even go into Baghdad to be able to drop so their Is that because of flight patterns and uh, risk or is that just because we don't want to drop a bomb late because of whatever reason? It's mostly deconfliction and timing, meaning you don't want to, if you run late, you don't want to start messing, you know, you've seen the, so the plans that start So only three of the nine on the, the nine first made night made it to their time on target. Mm -hmm. 
No shit. Of the stealthiest airplane that's been ever been made. And like still what are one there. or two reasons the others did not make uh, it? I will, I will simply say there were some logistics <laughs> involved and some assumptions that were made. Um, so if, did, uh, if uh, as an example, <laughs> if, if you're a planner and it takes 20 minutes to do something, or say, let's use the making a baby. You know, nine months to make a baby. And you, because maybe when you plan all this out, it'd be a little more convenient for everybody if it only took eight months. And you change that number, and nobody catches it, it doesn't work, right? At some point, the numbers catch up with you. So there had been some assumptions made that were not physically even possible that cost the rest of the string, Ooh. you know. And by the time we knew it was happening, I never knew it was happening because I was first. So it didn't affect me whatsoever. And that was just night one. That was just and night this one. And this went on for another three, four days. Yes, and we fixed it after, you know, obviously fixed it instantly as it was going down. Wow. But I didn't know about it because I'm already up, you know, right. flying over Baghdad, you know, on my way to Baghdad by the time this starts happening. And imagine my surprise. Because I think nine of us were there and, you know, stuff's blowing up when I hit my second target. You know, you can see stuff blowing up and, and it's like, you know, yeah. And then I come find out there's actually only three of us there. Interesting. Out of the original Anybody, nine. Uh, quote unquote, get in trouble? There was a, Reprimanded or whatever the term is? Yeah. Um, there were <laughs> repercussions for that event. So. Did, uh, you, you may or may not know, but does it go through your or any other pilot's mind? Like, we're probably killing people? Yeah. Um, you become one with that pretty early on. And even, even at pilot training, at some point, and I was a commander of a flying training squadron where I taught folks how to transition them from flying, you know, before I sent them off to a fighter or a bomber, you would bring them in and say, okay, all right, you know, you joined the military, so I know you kind of get it, right? And militaries involve killing other people. Uh, but before you go into a career of you could be killing not just a few people, but in mass, lots of people with what you're doing. Um, you need to be at one with that before you make your selection. Interesting. So if you were one of, say you were my number three guy, um, and I would say, hey, I'm looking at sending you off to a B-1 bomber. David, you've done great. I think you're going to be very successful. You can go forth and employ this bomber for this nation for the next probably 20 years if you want to. I go, but, you know, you okay with you know, looking at mom and kids in the eye and knowing that uh, yeah, there's some death and destruction at the other end of that? Do you come um, across some of your colleagues that aren't okay with that, or most because the line of the line of work they're in, they're, they could obviously be okay with it. Most, it catches most people early on, so they end up. Uh, you end up, in, and if you if you answered me like yes, sir, I'm ready to go, but I really got the feeling you're not, then I might I might put you in a different airplane, um, because of I was like, well, he, he thinks he is, but I, you know, I'm not getting that warfighter. Like, are we good? No, you're not good. <laughs> um, you know, feel wow. from it. Um, but yeah. there are some people there at that time. Uh, they they did have mental health folks available in theater, not just for Air Force folks, but you know, I would say, I would say we have it easy. And I'm I'm speaking only from one person's opinion. But I think we're removed from the battlefield. You know, I don't see the people. I don't look them in the eye. Right. I'm not particularly threatened by those people either. Right. You know, it's not like they have a fair shot at me. Sure. I'm up there and I'm yeah. going really fast, oh, yeah. and they have no idea I'm there. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, but. There, there's some folks that handle that differently. So, so yourself and your fellow pilots. I mean, three, four, or four or five days. It's over. Then what? Well, the I happened to. Uh, I went back to the states a few days later um, for a job interview. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but of, of all things, um, the I'd been trying out for the Thunderbirds to get on the aerial demonstration team, and sure, you know, war kicks off. So that's obviously more important oh. than uh, flying what we call loops to music. Um, but eventually, while I was, was over there, I made the finals for the Thunderbirds. Wow. And the interviews were coming up, and they, you know, my boss called me in and said, hey, this is night four of the war. I'd flown the first three nights. Um, this is night four. Uh, comes in and says, hey, go see Colonel so-and-so. Uh, Roberson was his name. And I was like, you know, you're assuming you're in trouble when you go see a colonel, right? And you're like, ooh, colonel's bad. Uh, um, so it's like, okay, and he goes, hey, good news, you're out of here in 12 hours, you're going back to the States. Uh, you made the finals for the Thunderbirds. And wow. I kind of looked at him, and warfighter communication is a little different than day-to-day -day political communication. And I said, well, you know, the heck I am. You know, it, it's, it's like, what? You know, we're doing what we've trained our whole lives to do for. And he's like, well, largely your target set for the F-117 is the first few nights. Yeah. He goes, largely that's done. And he goes, and you as a person will do more for the 
Air Force as being part of a demonstration mm -hmm. team where you're now affecting, you know, talking to kids and, mm -hmm. you know, God. recruiting for the Air Force. It's like your job's done here. Just go off and, uh, wow. and, and do this. So I reluctantly was literally on an airplane out of the combat zone in 12 hours. And you talk about a mindset shift. Going that was, from, that was, I was about yeah. to say mind fuck, but yes, that's a mindset yes, right? shift. That it, a mindset shift it, it's that like, is. It's like we're here, we're doing the mission, we're still all wow. hop, hopped up on the fact that this is going down. We're at the trickling edge of shock and awe. 72 hour point, right? So kind of the, the bulk of it's behind us. The ground forces are in and doing their, their work downtown. We've been all over CNN. My tape didn't make CNN because I decided to uh, quote some uh, Pulp Fiction in there that was not found usable. Um, <laughs> that's okay. Uh, but wow. it's the, you know, you go from that to the, hey, you're going back to the States. So, yeah. so I went back and I was literally in Las Vegas a few days later flying with the Thunderbirds trying to make the team. Wow. <laughs> I can somewhat relate only in the sense that I did uh, three back-to-back -to -back tours to Iraq, got out, and I'm an English 101 at the college. Mm -hmm. And that was like, a, that was a mindset shift, if, if you will. Yeah, and people well. ask, you know, so what have you been up to? <laughs> yeah, but, well, uh, I don't really, you know, you either, <laughs> Thank you, but you probably just won't get it. It's, it's like, if you, you know, for mine, it was all over, you know, the shock and awe had got a lot of press, right? Sure. Because it was, it was a cool name, catchy title. Yeah. And it was just like, yeah, I, that was me. I was just doing that uh, a few days ago. And they're like, really? So I was like, yeah. <laughs> and they're like, and now you're here? And I'm like, yeah, that's, that's kind of the shock too. But from a unit perspective, it was kind of weird because I came back and it was almost, I felt unfair and I felt like I was, I was cheating my squadron because I was, and I didn't have any choice over it, to be honest. Uh, they were like, nope, you're going, mm -hmm. and yes, sir. Um, but I came home early where the squadron didn't come home for a couple months later. So when I came home, uh, I was the only one that wasn't married. So I had a longtime girlfriend, now my wife, she meets me at the airport. The other spouses are there to meet me at the airport. You know, here's the, the standard returning war hero type scene. Uh, but, their, but everybody else's husbands weren't there. That's and a, they're not coming home anytime soon. Yeah. And it's not over. And we had no idea how long this was gonna last, whether it'd be a couple months or six uh, months or a year. Uh, so I felt bad from that. That was a weird perspective. And then, so Very I go off interview for the Thunderbirds, did not make the team, um, came back, and now I'm sitting in my unit, in my squadron. Like rear, you know, rear detachment, rear all my, all my bros are off still fighting the war, and I'm at, that, hanging out in New Mexico. Been, yeah, that's so a it's, tough moment. It was kind of weird. Yeah, it was just weird. Yeah, it was weird. I get so. it. So completely flipped the script now. Sure. A lot of pilots get out and remain pilots. You got out and said, <laughs> hey, let me go down this entrepreneur path. I, uh, I've been very blessed in my life. Um, to have an amazing job, which flying a fighter, let alone the F-117, but really any fighter, really any flying job is amazing, but really getting to do uh, some amazing things. And most of the follow-on for pilots is after your military career, when you're still, you're old in the military because you turned 40. I can't uh, you're young in the real world because you still have, you know, two, three decades of, of, of you know, at least of useful work in you. Uh, most, of, most everybody goes to the airlines. Uh, I had talked to my friends that had gone to the airline, and I just there was not going to be enough job satisfaction for me personally uh, flying an airline. Important job, obviously, it takes thousands of professionals to be able to safely move people around. It wasn't for me, uh, so that's why I said I got my my license and everything and prepared just in case. But that's when I said, you know what, I'm going to go do uh, what I had thought about doing way back in high school, and that's open my own business and, and pursue that. So what was the first business you opened? Well, I opened, uh, I, I couldn't leave the airplane behind. <laughs> so I, I opened a wealth management firm called Afterburner Financial. Okay. And when I, th when I say, you know, people ask you like, did you always want to be a pilot? And it's like, well, I didn't until I saw Top Gun. Um, at the same time frame, and I'm, I'm older than you, probably older than most of your listeners out there, but there was a show called Family Ties with uh, Michael J. Fox, Alex P. Keaton, and he was yeah. this nerdy kid carrying a briefcase in high school and he was a young investor and carried the Wall Street Journal around. So I said, you know, I really want to do that. And I became an investor at a young age, kind of as a hobby for myself. Um, and then I was like, well, I'm gonna go try to be a fighter pilot. If I can't, then you know, I'll probably get out and be a consultant, but eventually I will end up in investing. And it's a lot easy to invest nowadays, Rob, all online. Sure, How yeah, did you invest deep. back in those days? Well, I don't even really remember other than it was all through USAA because we're a military family. Oh, okay. And they had mutual funds. And my parents said, hey, if you get a job, 
uh, you know, and make some money, we'll match money into your IRA. And, I, you know, I'm a kid. So I'm That's looking a good at lesson like, at that age, though. Yeah, but I'm looking at them like, well, you're saying these words. I don't know what they mean. I don't care because I want to go hang out with my friend, you know, teenage life. Right. And but I'm like, well, that kind of sounds like free money. I'm like, <laughs> yes, free money. I'm like, oh, well, I, everybody understands free money. Um, so I went and got a job and they matched. You know, I kept the money and they put the two thousand dollars, which was the limit at the time. <clears throat> and by the time they had done that and I encourage all parents if you have the means to do it get your children started early Amen. they I learned and built the habit patterns and also had enough financial built up over you know a few years of investing to where I kind of got it I was like wow all I have to do is save and invest money and I'll have tons of money later on well half that battle I'll you got that. it is start early I it wish is. I would have known that I wish I yeah. would have did that I do have my son on that path he's eight now mm -hmm. I opened him a Charles Schwab account a little bit back, I put something every month in for them. Yeah, and the, the kids, the the kids won't understand for a long time. But what? So but eventually they will. You're right. Eventually they will, and you'll thank eventually yourself for, for doing that. So you had this hobby, maybe a passion for finance. But when you got out, what what made you really go into the business of finance then? Well, one thing that frustrated me in the military was. And I was very privileged, and I was promoted early uh, to lieutenant colonel. But there was very, there was very few opportunities to get ahead of your peer group and really move at your own pace. Financially, you're talking. Um, I would say just uh, in roles and responsibilities, and, okay. and financial. Okay. So you couldn't really, uh, you couldn't really get out there and do everything you wanted to do. And a friend of mine said it best the other day. He was talking about entrepreneurship, and he said, "I wanted to bet on myself." And in the military, no matter how good you were, you were still only moving up so fast. And to be able to be a boss, you had to be 45 years old and be a colonel. And it's like you can't do that faster than the system allows you to do it. Sure. So I really, it wasn't really the financial aspect of it. That's a piece. But really, it's the I wanted to get out and do something on my own. I can Because I that. really I was, had a lot of self-confidence. And I'm like, I just want this to be my thing. I want to be at the top of the... The, the, the org chart. And even if I fail, <laughs> e even if I fail, because, you know, I've got all this confidence and I think I can just like every other entrepreneur out there. And, and God bless everybody that goes down that path. Just realize you may fail. Yeah. And I, that's when I told my wife, you know, it's the, hey, we're going we're gonna to retire. We're going to relocate to Texas, Austin, Texas, best place ever. Uh, the, so we relocated this really cool place. And I said, honey, I want three years uh, to build my own financial services firm, primarily wealth management. I go, but if I fail after three years, because we're eating up savings doing this, obviously, because I'm sure. building my business, sure, so there's sure. not income. I get uh, it. Been down that road. Um, it's the, hey, I'll do this for three years. If I fail miserably, I will, you know, apply for the airlines and be, you know, get my airline job. And of course, then I would have to be away from home, which is why I really, you know, I wanted to be around my kids anyway. You know, I didn't want to be traveling. So. But I, I told her, I'm like, I would rather try this than fail than not have ever tried it. You know, it's funny, in the military, we joke around, you know, failure is not an option and all these little slogans and whatnot. And entrepreneurship, yeah. uh, failure is an option. And statistically speaking, you're probably going to fail uh, a couple times down, down your path if you stick with entrepreneurship. And that's what I love about th that point you make right there is when, you know, I'm, I just turned 52 last week. So, you know, I'm old, if you will, in the eyes of, of a large portion of you know, the millennial crowd. But what I really love, and you know, people are like, well, now that you're old, do you think the millennials are you know, not motivated, lazy? And I'm like, I don't think that at all. I think the world of the millennial crowd, because they are entrepreneurs through social media. Hmm. They are constantly trying new things, whether it be Instagram or now TikTok is you know, kind of the latest craze. But whatever it is, they're out there, they're creating content, they're facing immediate feedback, of which some of it's completely ugly. Um, you know, they're not scared to put stuff out there, see what works, knowing that failure, failure is part of it to get to something that does work. I will agree to a certain extent, but I would push back and say how many of those entrepreneurs on TikTok are actually making money and honest. I mean, you know, how many are actually making a full blown business out of it? Uh, I, I agree. I would, but I, would, I think I would it's ask. that it's the mindset. But I like the shift. mindset. I agree. Um, so similar to my investor story of you're building a discipline and a skill set that's going to pay benefits later on. Sure. Not necessarily right now. I'll but buy it's, that. Uh, but, it, but it's the, cool the to see people not being OK with failure. Because you're right in the military. It's just like failure is never an option. It's like entrepreneur world. It's part of it. Right. right. You got to yeah. be OK with yeah. it. It's, it's uh, 
It's a different human to be able to go down that entrepreneur path. And I always get in this conversation, you could have the entrepreneurial spirit and have like, okay, I'm creative, I'm a self-starter, I have the entrepreneurial spirit, but yet you're, you know, employee 30 at a 700 person company. Well, eh, okay, I would push back. You're not really quite an entrepreneur. I say, when you rely, like you did, when you rely on you yourself or maybe a small team you put together for your dinner tonight and tomorrow, yeah, you're an entrepreneur. Yeah, I, I agree. It's, uh, and I think folks that think they have the entrepreneurial spirit that don't leave that big company probably don't have it as much as they think they do. <laughs> Or, yeah, that and the, the whatever, the, uh, the, the guts to go do it or whatever yeah. it is. But, yeah, so the, the business of financial management, mm -hmm. how much, I mean, how much did you have to learn about it? And really, do you dig down deep into the weeds for your clients? Are you taking their money and buying stocks for them? Or what does it all mean? Uh, I do. That's exactly what I do. Uh, Hands-on, actively manage portfolios. Oh, wow. um, passive management can be a good thing. You can be hands-off and largely the industry... Uh, from the 80s and 90s told us that they're smart and we're dumb and that you should never try to do anything smart with your money. You simply spread it all out uh, into the different allocations and you pay us a heavy fee and please don't intervene. Huh. I hated that as a, as a consumer. Um, I, you know, I would call in and ask about some things. I could never get anybody on the phone who knew anything. It was all just, you know, mm -hmm. don't do that. We're smart, you're dumb. Don't try to pretend. I hated that. I went into business to basically to rebel against that. So I say, <laughs> I partner with my, you know, if you were a client, I would say, hey, here's what, here's what I invest in. I have all my clients in, and I'd bring out, you know, 40 or 50 different individual stocks that we're in, and some index funds, because index, fund, index funds are great because they're very cheap. Um, and here's how I would recommend for your portfolio. And part of that is good, smart, disciplined money management and allocation, but it's supplemented by, you know, hey, why not let's let's have some individual shares of Amazon out there? How about Apple? How about Google? How about some of these other companies that you believe in? Uh, let's get some individual shares of that that don't have any fees associated with them, and then build your wealth that way. And it's you're very it's very efficient. You're independent. I'm completely independent, except for I use Schwab as the custodian. So, like, if a client signs on, instead of them giving their money to me, because you don't ever want to hand your money to a financial person because of all the thieves and crooks that have been in the business. Um, they send their money into Charles Schwab, and that's Charles Schwab is their brokerage custodian that creates the account statements, right, okay. tax forms, all right, of that. Right. And then I have a login that allows me as the manager to go in and see their portfolio and make adjustments to their portfolio hmm. um, to make sure it's optimized for, for what they're trying to do. What are the top two questions somebody needs to ask when interviewing or evaluating a financial professional financial advisor? Um, are you a fiduciary is number one. So fiduciary is a term that's thrown around which a lot, not a lot of people uh, know what it means, but it means a fiduciary has to act in your best interest. By law. By law. So if you come into my office <coughs> and say, I want to do this, I, if, if it's not the right thing for you, I can't advise you to do that, even if I would make a commission. And fiduciaries oh, okay, don't make right, commissions, right, right. So, so they stay completely out of the commission and sales part of it. So you're not so, just selling high commissionable products like mutual fund, funds from these different financial institutions. Sure, annuities, some life insurance right, products get right. into this. Those all have roles, so I'm not saying they're bad. They all have roles for certain people. But for the most part, they are sales products, packaged, you know, financial <laughs> engineering is involved. Uh, you're talking to a person that is doing a transaction, basically. Uh, you and I have a transaction, you buy an annuity, I walk out with $4,000. It's like mm. that is, financial advice should all be relationship based and it should be um, no commissions involved. It should be a flat fee, which is myself and many others, and the whole industry, industry is gonna go this way eventually. Um, just because it's more efficient and it's better for the consumer. So but that's one, is are you a fiduciary? Yeah. And then the second one is, you know, you have to be able to enjoy working with the person. Mm. because you're going to be talking to them and they basically have their, you know, when, for my clients, I have their futures in my hands because this is largely most, if not all of the money they have. They've worked an entire lifetime over it. So can they trust me? Do, can they communicate with me? Can I communicate with them? Can I explain things to them versus just saying, I've got this, don't worry about it. 
Um, that relationship is so important. It's the same level of relationship you need with your with your doctor, or priest, or lawyer, or anybody else they bring into your life. Do you just assume they all have the same level of financial knowledge of just the industry and the financial markets, or how does one even gauge that if they're not a you know financial whiz? Everyone is different. So when I think of a skill set that I have, is I'm able to explain uh, complex topics in simple terms differently, and it comes from teaching people to fly is if I'm trying to teach you how to land an airplane, there's really about 10 different ways to teach you. Hmm. I can just show you in the airplane and some people are like, I just need to see it once I got, some people need to hear everything that's going on. So you learn as an instructor to be able to teach things several different oh, ways interesting. because people learn differently. Hmm. So therefore in the finance world, everybody's different. Some people know a lot, some people know nothing and don't want to know anything. Hmm. Uh, you know, I just, please handle it. You'll, you'll scare me if you, tell, if you tell me too much. So it's really respecting the individual and what they want out of their advisor and then kind of explaining, explaining it you know, in kind of their perfect manner. So. I know you get out a lot of information. How do people find you? I know you do a lot on YouTube, getting out free financial advice, or I don't know if advice is the right word, but just good content for people that, you know, if they're trying to learn more about the financial sure. markets or what to do. So how do people find you and sure. get a hold of you? Uh, the best way to find me is anchorstarwealth.com. Uh, you'd mentioned earlier, you know, I'd started as Afterburner Financial, and my wife likes to give me a hard time because I couldn't let the airplane go, right? Because I, yeah, I had to tie it that, and I still have the, the logo. Ha it has an F-15 in the middle of it, um, and I still I kept that. So instead of Afterburner Financial, now it's Anchor Star Wealth. Uh, so AnchorStarWealth.com is where people can find me, or simply Google my last name. It's unique enough to where it'll, yeah. it'll get you. Um, that's for folks that are looking for financial services, which is not, most people don't start there. Right, unless you're thinking today, like, oh gosh, somebody just passed away and I have a chunk of money. You know, there's an opportunity, you know, you might need somebody today. Mm. But that's where I am when you eventually, if you want to come on board or want God. to have that conversation. Like if that. you want to just educate yourself, I do two things to basically give back, if you will. I have a podcast called On Time, On Target Now, uh, which is financial strategies uh, for everybody that kind of, where you can listen to, if you're 35, I have an episode that's, you know, where should you be financially at 35 years old? I explain, uh, you know, I have an episode on how do college savings plans work. They're 15 to 20 minutes long, so, you know, finance is boring. I get it. Uh, so you can't kill somebody with a, with a long one. But I basically formulate each of my podcast episodes as a question. Interesting. And I'm trying to read your mind. Like, what question would you have? And then, right. um, then answer it in a very simple, simple manner. Uh, so that's the second thing I have is the podcast. And that's where most people can... can uh, can plug in, if you will. On Time, On Target, it's on YouTube, as well as uh, all of the major uh, podcast players. And the last part is I speak. Um, I go around the country, I'll speak to whoever wants to hear a uh, cool military story, and I'll basically stay as long as they want for me to answer questions. So, Love it. Yeah. Check it out, On Time, On Target now. Appreciate you, Steve. Thanks for coming down. You bet. Thanks, David, so much.